Mm-hmm. I love that, bro. Anything that you would like to share like this morning um, for us that, 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 that's in your heart? What the guy you was playing was preaching about is what I tell people all the time. I wouldn't say all the time, but I mention it to people. It's like people are perishing. And it's like, if you think you're going to get to heaven and you didn't tell your neighbor about Jesus, then you're probably believing in a lie. Because if the second commandment is to love your neighbor as, as, as yourself, as the Lord Jesus Christ loved us, then how could you stand before the Lord on judgment day and say, oh, I got saved, but I didn't tell my neighbors and expect that you were saved? You know, that, then you didn't, you broke, you broke the very second commandment that you were given. The commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor. You didn't love your neighbor if you watched him go to hell and you said nothing. That would be the epitome of not loving them. Um, so you stood idly by and watched them die, watched them, you know, go toward death. And so we should be with urgency realizing that like people around us are dead and perishing and we must with urgency, they need to wake up to the gospel. Like this is something that has to be done with more urgency. And, and I'm not, I'm not preaching it on my part, on all of our parts. Um, it's like, all right, our neighbors, the people, the guy walking down by, on the street next to you, he's perishing. Right, the attractive girl that you used to want to approach to get a phone number that you see on the street, she's perishing. If you would approach her to get her number in the past, how about you approach her to tell her about the Lord today? Because she's perishing if she doesn't, if she hasn't accepted the gospel. So we can't just stand idly by and watch people perish and think that we're safe. If you had a life raft and you were in the middle of an ocean and you were on the life raft and you didn't pull nobody else onto the raft with you and you just let everybody drown and die, like you're, you're, you'll be judged for that. You know, he's like, well, I'm safe, so I'm on the raft, so I'm good. I'm no, no. You're gonna if you let everyone around you die, you'll be judged. So we have to do, we do have to take it more serious to making sure that those around us know the truth of the gospel, even if they reject us, forsake us, curse us, and 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 uh, be angry about us telling them. But we have to tell them uh, that way. You know, on that day, we can say, Lord, I told everybody that I had access to about Jesus, and no one's gonna be able to say He never told me. He let me perish. No, I told I told them all, you know, so we, we do have to, with more urgency, uh, realize the severity of that people are perishing for eternity. It's serious. You know, this hey, is Eddie, just, Eddie, what would be the best way to approach someone? It, every situation is different, um, George. I, be led by the Holy Spirit, man. Every situation is different, but it's better to, it's better to, to say anything than to say nothing. I don't want to talk too much. If you want to go ahead, then you can go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead, bro. For sure. sure really, really, really. And make sure you be as direct as possible, man. Um, I know like when I was living a lifestyle of fornication, no one told me anything. People hinted at things. They alluded to things. They may have, they said, you know, Eddie, what you're doing is not right. But I had no idea what they were talking about. You know, and I just kind of brushed it off because it's like, you know, no one looked me in the eyes and said, Eddie, you're fornicating. You're having sex outside of marriage. You're going to go to hell if you don't stop. You're perishing. Like what you're doing is leading to death. And if you don't stop it, you're going to go to hell. Our God does not like it. The Bible says flee fornication. It is God's will that you flee fornication. And you are outside of God's will. And what you're doing is you're destroying yourself and every single woman you come in contact with. You're leading them to death as well. And their blood will be on your hands. All right? If I'm going out seducing women and bringing them home or inviting women over and laying with them, I'm, I'm as blood on my hands, man. Right, because I'm leading them to death using my prowess, whatever, whatever it is, the gifts that God gave me to preach the gospel. I'm using to, to talk to women and seduce them. That's blood on my hands, man. You know, and if I don't stop, you're gonna perish. I, no one told me that, and I wish someone had. I mean, I would like to think if somebody told me, I would have said, Whoa, okay, because I was about truth, right? So if somebody would have told me that truth, I would like to think I would have changed. But if you just say to somebody, Oh, you know. Uh, God is not pleased or, 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 you know, uh, you know what I mean? It's like if somebody says, Hey, if you ever need anything, let me know. Like, that's not direct. And that's not direct enough. Like you're not going to let them know anything. Right. If they said, Hey, um, how about you let me do your grocery shopping for you? You seem like a busy guy. Then that's something that you could say yes to it's something direct. So I just say, when you tell somebody, um, try to be as direct as you can. And Jesus started preaching. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better that you lose your hand and have your whole body thrown into hellfire. So no one can. No, 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 he's being literal. That. Like he's actually being literal, but it's it's an exaggeration. I mean, resort, but it's an option. 
no one's going to have an excuse. What I'm saying is that no one is going to have an excuse for their sin. Right. If we take every measure the Lord said take before they complain that they couldn't stop. God. Now, if you say, Lord, I cut my, I did everything you said. I cut my hands off. I did all these things and I still couldn't stop. What else? Do, what, what, and, and no one helped me. All right, now you might have a case. Once again, last resort. I'm not saying that's not the first option there, but like, I don't think he's not, you know what I'm saying? He said, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. And he said this right after he talked about lust. If we read that scripture, he talks about lust and then says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. I don't think it's a coincidence. He wasn't talking about stealing in that passage. He was talking about looking with lust and it said, gouge your eye out. And then he said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So I just think that we, people, we, we have to stress the severity of sin. Um, people like to just placate, oh, it's okay, you're saved, and you just know every, everybody sins. And no, that's not what the Bible says, man. The Bible doesn't say everybody sins. It says, be perfect for your Father in heaven is perfect. It says, cease from sin. Jesus says, sin no more, or something worse will come upon you. Amen. Yeah, and then I, I once heard that there's a difference between sinning and being a sinner, so, um, like the, 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 the moment you turn to Christ, you repent and you're pretty much telling him like, you, you no longer want to, um, keep, keep living the life that you once did. Um, but it's like the same as someone who plays basketball and is a basketball player, right? Like I can, I, 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 hoop right i hoop but i'm not a hooper right like a hooper is like someone who does it um quote unquote religiously right who does it again and again and again i just hoop i can hoop right so i sin but i'm not a sinner is that right eddie can you go a little bit deeper into um i, I what i would say um there's a difference in making a mistake and being in willful sin. Um, right. If we, if we stress the severity, like let's just take murder, right? You can accidentally kill someone. You could have gotten a street fight and you accidentally killed someone, punched them in the head and that, you know, they fell down and it wasn't, you was, you what, that wasn't intentional. Now this a death has still occurred, right? And justice must be served on some level. But that one is called manslaughter, one is called murder. So that will fall under manslaughter. Um, but if you were accidentally killing people every week, it's not an accident anymore. So what I'm saying, like, if you can't say I accidentally kill somebody every week and I'm repenting because I'm accidentally killing people every week. At that point, it's not a mistake. Like you, you're, you, you're, you're, the, you're the thing. So I think like falling into temptation um, is different than habitually living in willful sin. Right, right. That's what I was trying. You know, monthly sin. You don't kill anybody every month either. John says, I'm writing these things so that you do not sin. But if anyone does sin, in the instance that you do sin, you have an advocate. And then in the next chapter... Um, he says, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. One who has been born of God keeps, you know, if anyone that's been born of God ceases from sinning, they don't continue in willful sin. I, I know this is stiff, but the reality is the gospel is stiff, man. You know, it's stiff. You know, the book of First John says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot continue to sin because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are made manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. 
So the Bible says the children of the devil continue in sin, but the children of God do not continue in sin. This is how you know the difference between a child of God and the child of the devil. This is the Bible, New Testament. Right. And, and, you know, the, the recording that I was, the YouTube video that I was just playing just now, uh, the guy was saying, uh, Richard was saying, like, we have to take the Bible at face value. Like, like what it says is truth. Like, like, um, like we have to believe all of it. Like it's either we exclude all of it or we believe all of it. Like um, we just can't be uh, cherry picking uh, things out of the Bible and and uh, obey, obey by them. Um, we have to fully, fully believe the whole thing um, at heart. 100%. And, and it's, we have to recognize it's serious. That's all. It's just it's serious, man. Like we, can, we can have fun. We can joke. We can have joy. But it's serious, right? I'm going to read one more scripture. Hebrews 10, 26 to 31 says, If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said it is mine to avenge. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So it says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment. That's Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. Yeah, and I think um, the, the, the reason why we, like, we don't like having this sort of conversation, like I, like instinctively, instinctively, um, one doesn't ha like to have this sort of conversation is because we know that we have to uh, essentially like deny ourselves, like deny our flesh, deny our own personal life uh, to to seek him and to know him and to do his will. Um, can you go deeper into like, um, Eddie, can you go deeper into like what it actually like um, means to like, Deny yourself. But Jesus says, forsake all you have and follow me. Yeah. Um, people think that being a Christian is just going to church on Sundays, reading your Bible, and, um, and that's it. But Jesus says, forsake all you have and follow him, that those who follow him will carry their cross daily and walk after him. I mean, it's a daily commitment to walking and following Jesus Christ each and every day. Right, forsaking ourselves, denying our flesh, and walking after Him. Like people, it's not just like everyone. As long as you say you believe, like what's the testament to you believe? The Bible says, "Faith without works is dead." How do you know you believe? Because you say you do. Right? If yeah, your, your belief, if your belief is in your heart, it'll be reflected in all of your life. The Bible says, "Guard your heart, for all you do flows from it." So, if any belief is in your heart, it'll be reflected throughout all of your life. Like your life will be an example of what you say you believe in. And so, you know, when, you know, so the, the commitment to following the Lord is forsaking every single thing that displeases him. You don't have to give up everything, but everything that displeases God and turning from it and trusting in him. You know, I tell people, you know, like the, the devil gives us fast food. It's a quick fix. It's immediate. It's fast. But sometimes with God, we have to wait. We have to wait for the home cooked meal. That'll satisfy us for a long time. And so we have to learn how to, the Bible says those who endure to the end will be saved. What are we going to have to endure? There's going to be hardships. It's going to be persecution. It's going to be challenging times. It's going to be things we have to overcome. That's why the Bible talks about overcoming. In this world, you'll have trouble. What trouble are you having in America as a Christian right now? You know, like, 
But is the Lord, is the word of the Lord exempt from us because we're in America? No, true believers are gonna are gonna have their challenges. Because God is sovereign, you know. So uh, you know, I I know I've been talking a lot. I'm a. <laughs> Nah, bro, you good, you good. Thank you, thank you. That 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 could be the course to getting free, um, for you. Uh, but you're still in it. So the point is that our hearts have to be pure. And I and I, what I what I'll just round up by saying is that, um, and if you want your heart to be pure, you ask God and you desire it. Um, you know, I, I desi desired last night. I, I was feeling like, man, I'm getting. I was getting kind of comfortable. Um, this week and I was like man I'm getting kind of comfortable I got I want to do a little fast because I feel like I'm getting a little too comfortable and um, I, I, you know I want to keep what I have with God right? like I really value what I have with God and I want to keep it and I want to make sure that the fire stays lit and so I said um, you know I, I just decided in my heart that man I got to get myself right so I, because my prayers were they were they were still praying but they weren't as deep as they were and um It, and through me desiring in my heart to reconnect with God in the depths of my heart the way that I want to, that, that brought it forth. So what I mean by that is no one taught a baby how to walk, right? You didn't teach the baby how to fire the neurons in their brain into their legs to create leg movement, right? The child saw you walk. You may have held their hands and helped them stand up, but you didn't teach them how to make their legs move. They had to conceive desire in their heart to want to walk. And through that desire, they found the neurological pathways necessary to create leg and body movement so that they would walk, right? And so what I, and, and that goes for anything, right? No one teaches you how to blink. No one teaches you right now. No one taught me how to talk and how to make, how to make my voice work, right? It's in desiring to speak and hearing language and learning it, you create the neurological pathways to make it happen. So when you want to turn from sin, when you want to connect with God, when you want to develop true desire and passion for God, you have to conceive that in your heart. And when you desire it, you will find the way to connect that way. God says, draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. But to draw near to God, you have to desire to in your heart. I desire to draw near to God. You know, I desire to draw near to God. Like I was, I was worshiping in my room last night before I went to sleep and it still just wasn't feeling right. It's like, I'm worshiping, I'm, but I'm like, I'm like shouting and I'm like, man, I'm trying to just connect. Like what, I just feel like I got comfortable this week. I'm trying to connect, man. And then it still wasn't feeling right. So I, I cried out to God this morning on my face, just crying, just wanting to be connected. And I, I, I connected back like the way that I'm, that I'm used to, you know, but you have to want it. You have to want it. This is not something you idly just, you cruise control through life, through your Christian faith. You have to want it. You have to want it in your heart. You have to want, you have to desire God from your heart. You have to desire to draw near to God from your heart. You have to want it and you have to want it bad. And when you want it bad, God is right there for you to receive you. But it can't be, you don't let, you know, what the enemy would like to do is dull us and numb our senses and numb us so that we don't, and to, to quell, to quench our fire, they're trying to squirt water on your fire. And in a little bit of water, you won't even notice it. Because it's just a little bit, but it's a, it's a chess game. So you have to want it bad and keep wanting it bad. Wake up every morning and say, I want it. Now, you know, let's not say bad, but I, you got to want it good. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to want it with all your heart. Say, God, I want this with all my heart. I surrender my soul. Help me, God. When I was ready to change my life, I cried out to God in sincerity in my heart. I wanted it bad and I got delivered right then. Because like, you got to want it bad. And you got to pray that the block be removed. That's keeping you or trying to block you from wanting it bad. But you have to want it bad. You have to want and desire fellowship with God through Jesus Christ deeply to the depths of your soul and all your heart, all your mind and all your soul. You have to want it bad. And, um, and when you want it bad, it's there for you. It's there for you. But it's not about the Bible says they worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Because it's, it's just a lot of lip service. God is not going to be mocked. He see your heart. No matter what's coming out your mouth, he can see your heart. So you have to want it bad. You know, you have to get on your face, get on your knees, whatever you do. You don't have to get on your face if you don't want to, but whatever you do, you have to want it bad and cry out to God in the name of Jesus Christ and want it bad. And God is there to receive you, but you got to want it. So that's all. Whoa. Whoa. That's, that's powerful, bro. Uh, CJ. Thank you so much for sharing that, Eddie. Wow. I personally 
as uh, just to let you guys know where, where I'm at with like this whole like lust thing and everything like that. I actually I don't experience that anymore. Um, um, I don't know if that's a um, that's something different for someone here for anybody here, but I don't um, I don't have that gravitational pull anymore. Um, it's weird because God really does change your heart and your mind. Uh, you know, he he kind of like resets it because the same women that I usually would usually lust over. Now, like when I look at them, I'm like, oh, like they they need the gospel. That's the first thing on my mind. That's literally the first thing on my mind. Oh, not weird. That's a blessing. Yeah, bro. I mean, that's a blessing. I mean, it's 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 a weird feeling. Um, going um you know going from where i was to you know um where i am right now it's it feels really good knowing that um you know just my heart changed and he did that i i, I didn't do anything all glory to god um but can you can you dive deeper into that uh eddie like deliverance well i mean lust is demonic right right I know we have modern culture now where like you know due to what i believe is the work of the enemy um it's become socially acceptable to watch pornography it's like you know everybody watches porn bro and like everybody does this and porn is also free you can type in the letter x on google and you'll get a bunch of free porn websites to watch porn so it's become socially and culturally acceptable to lust and that just shows you how far we've fallen as a as a western culture as a as a, as a globe right um, so, you know, but it is demonic, right? If you take, there's a difference between lust and desire, right? Desire is when lust becomes demonic. I mean, lust is when desire becomes demonic. It's like the difference between being hungry and being starving or being thirsty and being dehydrated. To be thirsty is healthy. So, all right, you go get some water. If you're dehydrated, that means you're, you're on the verge of death, right? If you're hungry, that's okay. Go get you some food. But if you're starving, you're on the verge of death. Um, if you have a desire, that's okay. But if you're lusting, you're on the verge of death. So uh, lust is where desire meets death, right? Starvation is where hunger meets death. Dehydration is where thirst meets death. And so lust, in essence, is demonic. It's where, you're, it's where your desires meet, come in contact with death because the Bible says sin leads to death. So a desire is healthy, but a lust means that this lust is compromising my ability to function like normal, right? If I'm starving, I can't work. I can't, people can't sleep when they're starving, right? They, they're, they're tossing and turning. If they're hungry, you can go to sleep if you're a little hungry. People intermediate fast, I, they fast, they can go to sleep if they're a little hungry. But it's hard to sleep if you're starving. People can go to sleep if they're a little thirsty, but it's hard to sleep if you're dehydrated. People can go to sleep if they have a desire but it's hard to sleep when you're lusting. You're tossing and turning in bed and you have to relieve this lust. Otherwise you can't sleep. So that's where lust, that's where desire meets death. And that's where it's lust. Um, and all those things would be a product of death and, and, and would be demonic. So um, a desire is healthy, but lust is, is demonic in all forms. You can desire your wife and you can lay with your wife, but you, when you lust after your wife, it means if I don't get, or, or, or I, I won't say I die, I take that back in Jesus' name. I, I, I won't be able to function. I won't be able to focus on my work. I won't be able to, to focus on what's in front of me. I won't be able to operate normally if, I don't, if me and my wife don't sleep together today. Now you have a lust for your wife that's become demonic. You've made her an idol. You've placed your ability to, to, to lay with her. You allow that to inhibit your, your ability to progress and move forward in life. So anytime you feel something inhibiting you, from being able to function normally, you know it's a demon. Um, that's where you begin to be feel overcome and this challenge, and you have to go relieve this. You have to do something about this, right? And, and it's because it's consuming you. That's when it becomes demonic. And the door to that demon is open through the sin. Once you sin, you open the doorway to that level of bondage. Answer your question, <laughs> but. Um, the, Bible says the, the Bible says the cowardly are going to go into the lake of fire too. The, not just like murderers, liars, thieves, and, and uh, fornicators and adulterers. Also the, the cowardly. 
So we can't be cowards. The Bible, God does not, he does not, you ever look, when you read the Old Testament, you'll see God always chose these men of valor. David was a man of valor. He was a warrior, you know, a fearless warrior, went up against a lion and the bear. Like God does not like cowardice. He does not like cowardice. He wants bold men of God that are without fear, that are willing to stand up for his will. He does not like cowardice, man. So if you're, if you're, if you feel cowardly or afraid and insecure, that isn't, God does not like that, man. He said the cowardly and the unbelieving. Um, that's not, and, and it's not, to, it's not, I'm not talking to anybody. I'm talking to myself too. You know, right. We can't be cowards. We have to be, we have to be bold and desire um, for God's will as much as possible. And if we feel like we cowardly, pray for help. Ask God, I feel like I'm, I'm, I repent for my cowardice. I've been a coward. Forgive me in the name of Jesus Christ, Father. Please help me develop boldness and courage that I might do your will in mm. the name of Jesus. You know, we can't be cowards. God hates, he does not like cowards. He, he's not, cowards are not coming into his kingdom. We think it's all, yeah, be, be meek, but, but be meek without fear. Be meek because it's God's will, not because you're meek because you're afraid. Don't turn the other cheek because you're afraid of the fight. Turn the other cheek because you know it is God's will that you don't fight. Right? It's like, you know, it's like, don't, don't, you know, there's guys that'll buy a woman a million dollars with a gift because they're afraid to lose her. And there's another guy that buys it because he loves her. Like, it's the same action, but it's, it's from two different places in your heart. And one of them is going to wow. be rejected. Hmm. You want to make sure you're not operating out of cowardice, but that you're operating out of love. So when you turn the other cheek, if somebody strikes you, you turn the other cheek, that's out of love. It's not because I'm afraid of the, of the altercation. I know it is God's will that I do not engage, and that I show love. And I'm not afraid. So it's nothing. It's the one thing that you turn the other cheek because you're afraid of a fight. You're afraid you're going to get beat up. It's another thing you turn the other cheek because God commands you to love. It's two, the same action, two different heart postures. One of them is rejected. One is received. So your, your righteousness is doing it out of the right place in your heart, not just by doing it. God is looking at our heart. Not in, first, before he looks at our physical actions.